for his powerful, impressionistic, figurative images that evoke the spectrum of human emotions, from the tragic to the comic. While serving as a faculty member of the University of Florida's art department, he established a national reputation as a major force in 20th century art. He was born on February 11, 1917, in Indiana, the son of a Baptist minister, but spent much of his childhood in Pennsylvania, where he discovered his love of art at an early age. Recovering from a childhood head injury, Williams was taught to draw by a family friend to amuse and distract him from the pain. It was to be a lasting distraction. His mother noticed his talent for drawing and arranged for art lessons. As a young adult, he experienced the horrors of war firsthand, a captain of combat engineers under General George Patton, he fought his way through Europe in 1944 and 1945. The frightful carnage he witnessed on the battlefields of Italy and France had a jarring effect on Williams, shaking the foundation of his beliefs about life, philosophy, and in particular, his father's conservative theology. His war experience profoundly changed his outlook and thus his art for the rest of his life. After the war, Williams came to believe instead in an existential philosophy that emphasizes every individual and his or her experience of life as unique and different and in, context of a hostile, in the context of a hostile and indifferent universe. Williams got married and found a low paying job in Philadelphia. <laughs> John and Martins. It was here that he was introduced to modern art and saw for the first time how he could best express his anxieties over the human condition. Under the GI Bill, he enrolled at Penn State University, where he earned his BS and his Master's of Education. He his chose a career in teaching beginning in 1951. Williams taught at the University of Southern California and the University of Texas, while his wife, Abinell, worked and raised their two children, Curtis and Kim. In 1960, the artist began a long and productive period of teaching at the University of Florida in Gainesville. In 1963, Williams received the Guggenheim Fellowship, which enabled him to write and publish a book on art, Notes for a Young Painter, revised and reprinted in 1984 by Prentice Hall Publishers. And I understand that's a book that's been very well received in the art community. Hiram Williams Art is part of the collection of the following major museums. Samuel B. Horn Museum of Art, University of Florida Gainesville, Jacksonville Art Museum, University of Texas, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, so Solomar Guggenheim Museum of Art, Smithsonian, Washington, DC, and Corcoran School of Art, and Corcoran Gallery of Art, sorry. He had uh, been named a Distinguished Service Professor and received the university's President's Bronze Medal. In 1994, Williams inducted, was inducted into the Florida Artists Hall of Fame. Hiram Williams' studio was small and windowless, illuminated by a skylight and some jury-rigged overhead lights. A, painter sp a paint spattered chair with drawing board dominated. Paintings that went on to hang in the places like the Museum of Modern Art and the Guggenheim first hung here on a battered piece of green plywood. But limited space and simplicity of means, simplicity of means was no obstacle to William's creativity. Thousands of drawings and paintings have emerged from this one room cubicle, crucible, for his searing, distinctive imagery. A few tubes of oil paint, charcoal, graphite, brushes in a soup of mineral spirits, and turpentine. That's all it took for Hiram Williams to turn an idea into a painting. He said, a good piece of art should tell you what it is doing, but a lot of this is subliminal. You are suddenly aware that you have this new information, but you have no idea how you got it. Artists could be likened to a man in a foggy hallway, groping to find a door at the other end. I used oil, graphite, and collage now and then, Williams said. Marks and shapes are functional and do things visually. They create tension, they hold positions, they suggest direction. They do all these besides illustrating descriptive or abstract appearance. Students years ago made weekly visits to Williams Studio and were exposed to a new volley of tough and daring imagery and left many of them convinced that nothing in life had as much potential for expression as painting the way Hiram Williams did it. 
process painting where the artist discovers the true subject of a painting through the act of painting it usually results in paintings of insistent and unrelenting abstraction. But William uses process painting to capture a world of totally unexpected subjects. Portraits of students, bananas, rocks, mountains, bouquets, meat tables, and his trademark image of the human figure in which he invades against the political climate of man's inhumanity to man. This is the very same emotion that continually plagued Abraham Ratner and had a perhaps profound influence on his work. Prior to his death, a documentary to accompany life art, the paintings of Hiram Williams, a new retrospective on his works at UF Horn Museum of Art. Williams discusses at length his philosophies of art. Although some have changed significantly, significantly over the years, many of his tenets remain the same. A painting, he says, is nothing but pigment on a surface. The artist has to acknowledge that picture plant as he creates illusion of pictorial depth. It is the dichotomy between these two illusions and flatness that make a painting a special entity. A painting is finished, Williams taught his students, when it has the form, unity, I'm sorry, when it has formal unity, the forms working together like a well-oiled machine. Every form in the painting has to be integral to the piece. Its loss would be like pulling a can out of a pyramid in a grocery store display, collapsing the visual structure of the entire painting. During every class, Williams would articulate his philosophy about paintings, leaving them to fester in his students' minds, emerging in their own works weeks and months later. Williams' enormous and sustained creativity is no accident. I never had artist's block, he says. In order to have art pursue you, you have to pursue art. Give up tennis, give up yachting, give up vacations, and just work. William maintains that any subject has potential as a metaphor to become a painting form that is charged with meaning, that can wring a variety of emotions from the viewer. I am very dependent on the viewer's reaction, William says. The form causes emotional meaning. We look at things and we react. I give them enough so they can create just just all, and I want that just all to move them emotionally. Williams relentlessly scours all of his experiences for new forms of expression. The simple of forms can lead to a series. Even the head he sees in the mirror. Williams said, the head, the outline of the head, is my head. I look in the mirror and shave every day, almost, and there it is, that doggone head, he says, in describing the inspiration for his landmark series of self-portraits. I've gotten so that I do it with my eyes closed, I think. Although far from being impersonal, Williams' art as is with much of modern and contemporary figure, figurative paintings, has a quality of facelessness about it. In this respect, each work reflects a loss of blur, or reflects a loss or blurring of individuality, as well as a mysteriousness and ambiguity. We all see, we see the unexpected. So this is slide two, Laughing Man in Green Grass. After his New York show in 1963, Williams continued working on a series of heads that he had begun earlier. Laughing Man is part of the series. These heads emphasize certain features, such as eyes, a nose, cheeks, or a mouth. Williams' idea is to try to create and convince a convincing head with only one feature defined, so that the viewer must supply the rest using his imagination. Right? It can be a stump seen on a vacant lot on a daily walk, as in the or Orton Stump series, or a snake on the Payne's Prairie near Gainesville. Williams said, I read somewhere in a scientific journal that, like National Geographic, that snakes have temperaments, much as you and I do as human beings. They were more human than we were. In some ways, and with that in mind, I thought what I'd do is show the snakes in the Payne's Prairie. I used to imagine walking among the snakes and how that would be. Williams explores these ideas initially with small sketches in his journal, 
Art Life, of which there are now more than 250. He does some studio, studio studies and collages of the subject, some bigger drawings, and finally, some paintings. During the Texas years, a faculty research grant freed him to concentrate his phenomenal energy on mammoth canvases of human figures. These 28 canvases completed in just four months were painted with the brio and vigor of abstract expressionists. His, his, his imagery continues to develop. I soon discovered overhead, overhead man. which led to stroboscopic figures. One man repeated, but not fractured, as in Duchamp's new descending the staircase, had all sorts of possibilities for scale and space. I was led to running men and stretching men. I began to realize that I was busy illustrating existential people, much in keeping with my views of humanity's plight in the real world. To my mind, it depicts the tension that we all express, experience as we live our modern time, live in modern times. I painted in the living room, he recalls, and Avenel worked and looked after the kids. This creative effort paid off with his breakthrough ideas for the Overhead Man series. Now this is The Guilty Two, painted in 1959. It's when he starts using a different perspective in his art. The view is looking down from above, it could be perceived as a single person squirming before a television camera. I thought this was interesting. It may have been inspired by the 1954 televised McCarthy hearings. Okay, slide six. Incubus is another type of overhead figure. He is caught in time intervals. He is seen from above as if the viewer were watching him from an apartment building. By attaching two views, front and back, Williams achieves simultaneity without fracturing. The end result is similar to an overlay when two or more frames of a moving picture are blended together. We see the unexpected viewpoints of Hiram Williams, who presents the figure not at eye level or in its normal special world, but foreshortened and utterly transformed by a new kind of vision. He said, I was trying to show the sides, various views of the figure, all in one, in an image without any fractures in it, like the cubist did. He used distorted and distended contour to simultaneously depict all sides of a total figure moving through space. Unlike the cubist, he kept an unbroken image to suggest the passage of time. Picasso would have shown part of that figure and then another part of that figure, but I show it without any fracturing, he says. His work began to attract national attention, and he was accepted in large exhibits such as Carnegie International, prominent institutions including the Whitney Museum of Art Museum, and Museum of Modern Art in New York acquired his paintings. Williams came to the University of Florida to teach in 1960, starting on the same day as renowned photographer Jerry Olsman, who eventually contributed to Williams' Gazer and Self-Portrait series. Jerry Olsman made me about 100 eyes, and I cut them out, and I used these eyes to depict my gazers, and so forth. Williams said, it's amazing with one element of the human being, can, what, what, what one element of the human being can bring on imaginatively. One eye can get pretty cool, doggone exciting. <laughs> Williams' imagery now included crowds initiating the chorus line and audience series, where he describes as an effort to look at my fellow man as a viewer of his own destiny in an uncaring world. Despite this outlook, Williams' work is marked increasingly by exuberant energy. Since retiring in retirement in 1982, his repertoire has exploded to include many new subjects. Not only did he continue his depiction of the human figure and objects that can be seen as extensions of the human figure, such as the Bloody Meat Table series, uh, he now mines personal experiences in Florida to, Im to image humanity in a subtler and deeper way. Much of this newer lexicon, bananas, alligators, snakes, crows, shorebirds, beaches, punch bowls, stumps, and palms, is an outgrowth of this encountered 
with the North Florida landscape. I identify creatures in Florida with the humanity in Florida, he says. There are a lot of alligators around here and a few snakes too. On the whole, the snakes are benign and you can run away from the alligators if you have sense to. And I have run away from alligators and snakes at my feet, you know. A self-suggestiveness, self-suggestiveness, Williams furnished minimal cues about his subjects that reflect their essence, inviting the viewer to fill in the details. I like the idea of the viewers completing the painting visually, he said. For example, there's an alligator, which I reduced to just the head. Okay. This is an alligator, he says. For the example, there's an alligator, which I reduced to just the head and a vague sense of the body in the water as he moves. And it bears quite a strong resemblance to the real thing. Humanity is ever the focus, and in some of his most poignant pieces, such as Audience Destroying Its Environment, William shows us what the audience does to its world. If my own experience is any criteria, he said, the painter, while immersed in a creative period in hopelessness, hopelessly lost among the affairs of the real world, like a child, he finds himself out of contact with adult areas of practical engagement. He finds himself unable to account, encounter society at any but the under levels. He has an affinity only with the antisocial or misfits, which many explain, which may explain the derelict life of many artists. The painter during these sessions has become so emotionally weak that he is unable to fend for himself. He becomes like some woman under the stress of menstrual period, easily hurt and easily moved to tears. He becomes weak, vacillating. He acts as deeply disturbed as a deeply disturbed person, as perhaps at these times he really is. Finally, the artist must believe in this image or idea. According to Williams, such believability depends upon several factors. The artist must first of all be concerned with this image. The final product must be emotionally satisfying to him. It must be convincing. It must convey a sense of unity in ends and means. It must be expressive. And it must have a finished look. All these are necessary for the work to have believability. The painting, The Running Man, symbolizes for Williams the condition of man in an existential age. It's men running from a sense of fright, from fear in the atomic age, men running out of their own loss of religion. Man in an existential age is confronted by the dilemma presented in an age that doesn't care about it. Williams said, he is fearful of a universe that seems to be unaware and unconscious of him. He likens it to a motion picture utilizing multiple overlays combined with freeze frames. Each view of the figure exists in what could be thought of as a Newtonian space. Read, read as a whole, the element of time is introduced. It's very, I found these pieces are very interesting to me. You know, different, very different. As a son of a Baptist minister, he said cheerfully and comfortably that he is an agnostic, did not believe in inspiration for the prima donna in art. Age and a series of ailments slowed Williams, but while he still tried to paint, while he still tried to paint every day, he died in 2003 at age 86. I came across this quote by Williams, which pretty much sums up his philosophy. I thought this was terrific. Artists are expected to create. It is reckoned as a life or death situation. I don't know why. Others aren't asked this, but the artist is asked to do things that no one else has done before to be a miracle worker. Most artists, as most artists, as talented as they may be, have to choose a steady career in order to supplement their career as artists. I know that was true of my father. I think that our faculty exhibit is the very best example of that. Um, there is an old, well-known quote that says, those who can't teach. I totally disagree with that. I think those who teach can 
and choose to share that knowledge with others in an effort to inspire them to do great things. Having said that, I would now like to welcome one of our very own, Elizabeth Indianas, to come up and say a few words. She has been an <coughs> art instructor here at the Tarpon Springs campus of St. Petersburg College for over 23 years and was a student of Hiram's at the University of Florida and at the University of South Florida. She's an accomplished artist and playwright, as well as having several art installations in the Tampa Bay area and other parts of Florida. She currently has a retrospective of her art and other creative accomplishments on exhibit at the Tarpon Springs Cultural Center through November. So without further ado, uh, and I think I will, no, what do I have to do here to get that? No, 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 no. She's going to show. No, no. Yeah. Okay, this is the book which Elizabeth gave me a copy of, so that's why I have it. Notes for a Young Painter. This is the book that he published. But right now we're going to have Elizabeth to talk about her experiences with my <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was wonderful, Carol. You're always so professional together on your presentations. I really appreciate it. It was just so refreshing to hear those stories again. A lot of some I didn't know. And, um, you know, to merge them with a couple of stories of my own as a student of Hiram Williams. I, uh, I do have some notes here. Uh, refresh myself. Uh, when I was at the University of Florida, uh, it was the early 1970s. And I remember uh, May 4th, if you can go back to the 70s, <laughs> students at Kent State University in Ohio were protesting the Vietnam War. 28 National Guard soldiers fired about 67 rounds over 13 seconds, killing four students and wounding nine others. At the same time, things were heating up at the University of Florida. I was in a humanities class with a great instructor learning about art history. We both walked out, out of class, walked out with my instructor, and immediately in the middle of a huge, we were in the middle of a huge protest scene with tear gas in front of the admin building, and we hugged each other in fear. The Black Student Union organized a peaceful sit-in protest inside uh, the university's president, Stephen O'Connell, in the hopes of demanding a, an African-American cultural center. But it resulted in the arrest of 66 students. O'Connell refused to grant complete amnesty to those student demonstrators who participated. And 125 of the university's African-American students and several of the black faculty members left the university in protest. So this was the backdrop uh, of which I would be a student of Hiram Williams. So at the time, we painting students would meet at Hiram's house, some ranch style house. It took some time to get through. I don't know if you know Gainesville, but a lot of woody areas. It was lovely to see in the woods, a lot of greenery. His wife, Evanel, would have cookies and punch, and then we would go into his very narrow studio. Surprising in its narrowness, like you described, Carol. The paintings all piled up with hardly much room to back up and to see, and it was like, they were right there, these, these big things. Not much room to look at. Hiram shared with us a portrait he was very frustrated over. He was struggling with this portrait and didn't know what to do because whatever was coming out of him were his true feelings and he couldn't gloss over and deny the truth of that. 
and that was President O'Connell, O'Connell's portrait, the president of the university. So he's in this political predicament. Uh, this thing had just happened, and the president of the college is, uh, we're in the middle of protest, the president of the college is not allowing African American students to have a voice to where they left, along with instructors. So, with that in mind, <laughs> uh, I, I was going to show you uh, Hiram's portrait. Uh, what did it look like? What? So here, uh, I'll show you a picture of Stephen McConnell. Okay, so this is the president of the University of Florida that is in this controversial time, and Hiram has to paint his portrait. He's struggling. He's showing us. His painting students He's having a hard time. What was the hard time? He made them look like the devil. <laughs> he, well, he had all but had horns, you know? And it, he just had this look. And what was he supposed to do? So he was struggling with that existential thing. This guy's the devil. I don't like him. He's doing bad things. I don't agree with But I'm an, I'm an artist and I'm painting the truth. So uh, that was thinking through Hiram Williams. I think he eventually glossed over it and found it in himself to make a kind of sort of neutral, uh, you know, looking thing. But we knew how he really felt. I was just a young student out of high school uh, when, when I was experiencing this stuff with uh, Hiram and Stephen O'Connell. And for Hiram, as Carol said, art was never a casual pursuit. He was called a relentless painter by one former student and a painter's painter by another. And he advocated total dedication to one's work. His 60 year career touched countless people all over, all over the arts, all over the world died at 85, was said, completely devoted to his art, said the artist and former student working of him, or working under Hiram Williams, is like being part of a religion. True enough. Uh, with that, let me just take a little bit of a read from his notes for a young painter. Uh, and he says, he says what he thinks if you're a painter. There are many painters, good or bad. The ones I admire are those who have kept the faith often while facing difficult survival. And then he goes on to mention different artists, uh, former students of his who kept the faith and, and sa says this one's doing this, this one's doing that. And then lo and behold, he says of me, Elizabeth Indianos is a mother and a housewife. Each of them paints and will continue come hell or high water, but each of them will give their eye teeth to have the opportunity to paint full time. Well, I took a little bit of issue with Hiram mm -hmm. saying I was a housewife and mother. Mm -hmm. At the time I'd gotten a grant, I was an NEA grant to be artist in residence in Tarpon Springs. And um, I was, yes, uh, I was a mother, but so we're, and, a, and you know, there are fathers. Some of the people he mentioned were mothers and fathers too, but somehow that was my identity. So I said, Hiram, why, why did you do that? And he said, huh, well, you're just a woman's liver, that's all. You're just a woman's liver. <laughs> At the time, totally forgivable. I loved Hiram, you know, he, uh, he reminded me of, um, of my father in a sense. Uh, Hiram was, uh, you know, a World, a World War II survivor. He was an artist. And he would paint these things called purple patches, which I'll talk about in a second. He'd point to an area and say, you see that? That's a purple patch, that's a purple patch. My father uh, was going to uh, RISD, but got drafted to go to war, as did Hiram. And he had a purple heart. So very different, but that purple thing left an impression upon me. Uh, 
On Hiram Williams, Kenneth Kerslake, a printmaking instructor that I had at the University of Florida, he was a, a good friend and a, a, of Hiram's, and he would say, people would ask me where Hiram's intensity came from. Hiram would say something to me like this, something happened to me, World War II. <clears throat> so there you go. That says it right there. Therefore, uh, you know, his existential crisis and, you know, son of a minister, but what do you say when you see, you know, like your Francis Bacon, you see these horrible images and you're involved in it. I know my father woke up uh, sleeping but screaming many times. I heard that. Okay. And, and some of yours. Right. So. Uh, here I am at the University of Florida, Hiram Williams, such a huge influence. I remember the first time I saw his paintings, it was two years before I was at the University of Florida at another university, I saw them and just <clears throat> looked, and it, it changed my life. Uh, unforgettable images. And then later, I'm a student of his, two years later. So I obviously didn't have the experiences of war, I'm 20 years old. So I painted in Hiram style houses and pies and cupcakes. I embossed things on paper. I used chiffon. Uh, and, and let me just show you. Back in the day when I was a student of Hiram uh, you know, so I painted eggs. It was like Hiram William. And uh, I he liked to use chiffon, so um, I was getting a hang of painting like Hiram Williams um, at the time. And some of these paintings that I did, a la Hiram Williams, hang in my family home in Maine, where the original portrait that he did of me also hangs in Maine. So, <coughs> Uh, let me pass on to you some of the things I teach my painting students that come directly from Hiram. Um, it's called the Purple Patch. Now the concept of the Purple Patch uh, means a juicy thing that is repeated here and there in a painting, but not everywhere. A Purple Patch delivers so much info that it carries across in work. So you saw some a chorus line uh, and some of Hiram's heads and portraits and things at Carol Schiff. Um, he would say, and I would tell this to students, I do, if you see one of Hiram's chorus lines, there are these outlines, like a paper doll, of the heads and hands connected and feet all on the bottom. So you know, I mean, if with the barest minimum of color, and by the way, Hiram didn't teach color. You never learned about color. You never learned about the color wheel. You never learned about value. That was not taught. You just were simply with him and you got him where you did it. So you have this chorus line all connected in a big piece that would go, you know, probably this whole wall. And so Hiram would say, you don't need to paint every single eye on this chorus line. You put an eye here, or maybe over here, or a breast. And that's enough. That carries across the whole thing this economy of the purple patch was something I teach to my students. Um, let's see. So again, a few was enough to get the idea and carry us all across the room in pain. Likewise, interestingly enough, I carry that concept, I apply it to my writing of screenplays and plays. A purple patch is very much like another concept in writing called a whiff of death. It's not really that macabre, but whether it's a purple patch in a painting or a whiff of death in a narrative, a movie, or a play, that covers and carries a lot, a lot of ground. It's like a shorthand, a symbol. We get the meaning. It's not on the nose, so to speak. On the nose meaning, uh, on the nose dialogue consists of dialogue lines 
that state the obvious information that we are the characters already know. We are the characters uh, in a play or a, a movie don't need to keep hearing things over and over again. We know. We know. We bring stuff we know. So you just put a whiff of something, like you put a purple patch on a painting because it will carry. You paint an eye here and there. You don't have to do them all. Well, Hiram died before my four screenplays and plays were written and pr produced. But I imagine that he would be delighted to know how his teachings jumped disciplines and purple patched all over the place. Mm -hmm.